Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told about us, us about. So. Thank you. One thing I will go ahead and mention as I get started, um, every other summer uh, we lead a mission trip down to Desemparados, Costa Rica to work with our missionary uh, Ronald Martinez and his congregation. I wanted to mention that I now have applications available to that. We've been posting them online, but if you'd like to learn a little more about the trip, I've got a small stack of those, and uh, I'll leave those sitting up here if you'd like to grab one of those before you head out today. I'm really glad that all of you could be present with us this morning. Um, during the month of December, we've been doing a sermon series that we're calling of the Savior. And what we're doing is that we're working our way through the story of Jesus, kind of in reverse order, reflecting on his significance and, and what he means. And as we do this, I've been incorporating a little bit more um, imagery and some stronger visuals, perhaps, than what we might normally do, just to help us as we reflect on Jesus and what he means to us. We began by looking at Jesus as our risen, glorified Savior. So we started with Jesus as he is now, because Jesus has now conquered the grave. He's conquered, therefore he's also conquered anything that could possibly hope to threaten us, anything that would make us feel afraid. Jesus has already risen, and so he has conquered these things. We are children of the resurrection, and we live uh, in that resurrection power. Moving from there, we talked about Jesus as our crucified Savior, because in order for him to be glorified, he did first have to be crucified, that he would humble himself even to the point of death on a cross. And because he was obedient throughout his life all the way to the end, because he honored all that he was supposed to be to the very end, God therefore glorified him. So we talked about Jesus as our crucified Savior. Part of what made him significant as our crucified Savior was that he was the perfect teacher and example. And this is what we spoke about last week, that Jesus was the one who came to show us the way, that we could look to him and know what it is to live a good life, that he would be our perfect example. And as we've been kind of working backwards through the story of Jesus, it is this morning that we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus, because part of what made Jesus our perfect example and our teacher is that he did become one of us that he was the Word of God. He was there in the beginning, as we'll talk about next week. And even though he was eternal with God, he chose to humble himself, to put on flesh, and become like one of us. So much so that the people who knew Jesus would sometimes just assume he was human and had a hard time even latching on to the idea that he could be divine because of how human he was. And of course, people who didn't grow up with him, who saw some of the miracles he performed, would be so struck by his divinity, they'd have a hard time imagining this guy could actually be human, right? So Jesus is a perfect blend of humanity and also divinity. But it matters that he came to this earth and became one of us so that he could be our teacher, he could be our savior, and that he could be glorified now in the presence of God. And so we think about that night with the shepherds, and the angels that appeared to them. It's hard to imagine, when you think of any king wanting to announce the birth of his child, it's hard to imagine any king that would start with such a lowly audience to share the good news. Just a group of shepherds working the night shift, out there doing jobs of seemingly very little importance. In fact, the kings, like King Herod, he had to find out about the birth of the Savior secondhand. The, the Messiah was coming, but someone else had to tell him because God didn't go to the kings, God didn't go to the powerful people, but instead he sent his messengers to the people that everyone just assumed were of no importance. But this is the way that the kingdom of heaven is supposed to work. It's a key theme in Jesus' ministry that the kingdom of heaven has come close. It's not unaccessible. It's not just for a high society that we can't reach. It's not just for people that we can't relate to. But the message of the gospel is good news for all people, even the lowly people that no one thought anything about, that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is breaking into the normal places where we actually live and do life. 
It's out there in the fields with those smelly animals. It's in the workplaces where people are getting paid a minimum wage. It's at the night shift that someone got stuck working because they didn't have the seniority to get a better schedule while most people were sleeping. It's in those places that God decided to go and announce the birth of his son. And in fact, Jesus continues this in his own teaching because when you reflect on so much of his teaching being in the parables, isn't he always just talking about agrarian life? He's talking to the real people in the real world where we actually live. And so as Jesus comes, born there in this humble place, in this humble setting, it's at this very moment that God makes this exclamation point in the form of thousands and thousands of angels. It says a host of angels being a military term. This is an army of angels who showed up to celebrate that God's son has been born. I don't know if you've ever tried to imagine what it would be like to be there at the nighttime and suddenly to see an army of angels up above your head. Think about the, you know, the darkness and then suddenly your pupils are all dilated because it's so bright and it's so loud and it says they were afraid and frightened. But finally, as your eyes start to adjust, you see that the faces of these angels, they're not here to harm you, but in fact, they're, they're smiling and they're shouting in joy because such a good thing has been done. God has added this great exclamation point at this moment in history, celebrating what has just occurred. He's not being subtle Jesus didn't just sneak into the world, but instead God has announced something good has come now for all people. It's an encouragement to us to know that when God has said, this person, this child that was born is so significant, his life will matter so much to each of you, it clarifies for each of us, what is it that I should do with my life? I mean, the answer is you attach your life to this person's life. You see what his story is, and we attach our stories to the story of Jesus Christ, that in every every way I want to identify with him, just as in every way he came to identify with us. We attach ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ because God has said, this is the most significant birth that has ever occurred. Not that all of your children aren't wonderful, but there's something really special about this one that's worth celebrating. And so we keep our eyes on Jesus. And this is a very happy time. One of the things I love about Luke's gospel is that the beginning of Luke's gospel, it's like the whole thing is set to music. They're singing and it breaks out all over the place. Uh, It starts off with with Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, getting a visit from an angel, finding out that she's going to give birth to John the Baptist. And then Mary goes to visit her cousin once Mary is is expecting her, her birth. And then she goes to visit Mary, and John the Baptist, even in the womb, starts leaping for joy. And then Mary sings a song. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It's one we sang a couple of weeks ago. But Mary breaks out into song. And then it's not too long after that that John the Baptist is born, and Zechariah hadn't spoken since his wife got pregnant. And now... He breaks out into song about what God is doing. And then, of course, Jesus is born, and now the angels are breaking out into song. So again, the beginning of Luke's gospel reads like it's a musical. Everyone just keeps singing because there's so many things to be happy about. In fact, it's something we continue to do very often when there is like a baptism. We all love singing at baptisms because we say a new birth has occurred. It's something that everyone can be happy about. It's a beautiful thing, and it's something to celebrate when you know that you've been favored by the Lord. I don't know if you've ever paused to reflect on all the dynamics that can be involved in what it means to be favored by the Lord. Have you ever thought about that? To really feel like God has has favored me. So when the angel first appeared to Mary to tell her what was going to happen, he greets her. He says, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You've been especially selected by God for something that's really wonderful. Now, parts of it do sound wonderful. You're going to give birth to a son. He's going to grow into a great person. Isn't that we all wish for our children? We want to see them grow up and be great people. Well, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a great person. He'll be the son of the Most High. He'll reign on King David's throne. Now, that sounds like favor to me. But, you know, there are some other components of what it meant to be favored by God that are a little bit less desirable. If you look at Jesus' own family and the companions that he had surrounding his birth story, you'll see that sometimes being favored by God is a rather tough journey. 
there's three different couples that show up in the early part of Luke's gospel, two male-female counterparts, three of these that I wanted to highlight this morning. What about Zechariah and Elizabeth? What did it mean for them to be favored by God? I mean, the bright side is they got to be John the Baptist's parents. You know, they're, they're related to Jesus himself, but it meant that they didn't get to have their first child until they were well along in years, that they spent many years childless. And for Elizabeth, what she said when she found out she was going to be having John is, finally, my disgrace will be removed from among the people. She felt herself disgraced because of how long they had to spend childless. But that, in her case, was part of what it meant to be favored by God. Zechariah hadn't wanted to believe the angel's prediction when it told him that he was going to have a son. And so, because of this, the angel said, you're not going to speak until he gets here. And so he had to spend months unable to talk. That doesn't really feel like being favored, but in fact, that was part of that process, wasn't it? What about Mary and Joseph? There's another couple. What did it mean for them to be favored? Well, there was that that wonderful promise of a child who will be a great man, who's going to change the world, who will be called the Son of God, reigning on the throne. But, you know, Mary was probably favored in part because of her faith and her good character, but by becoming by the will of God, an unwed pregnant teen, it's very likely that she had to have her character be maligned. Mary was probably thought less of. I've always wondered why it is that when that started happening, she took off to visit her cousin out of town. Maybe there was some shame involved in going through that experience. I also love the detail that, you know, God, I I think if I were Joseph, I would have said, Lord, I would have loved a little bit more advanced notice of what's going on, because the way that, that Joseph finds out about the pregnancy is, is actually, you know, finding out about the pregnancy. And it's not till he's made up his mind to walk away that God intervenes and says, well, by the way, this was, this was my doing. You know, I would have liked to have known that a little bit sooner, God. But that, in his case, was what it meant to be favored by the Lord. Later, it meant that because God has favored them and given them this child, that King Herod was going to try and murder their child and indeed would murder many children. They had to flee for their lives to Egypt. See, when we align ourselves with God and with Jesus Christ, God has some some powerful enemies who mean to do us harm. And so being favored by God for for them meant fleeing for their lives for a period of time. And of course, there's some of those awkward circumstances along the way. I mean, what would it be like to have your son that you're raising be Jesus Christ? We only have one story to share, but think about how awful those three days must have been when they went down to worship in Jerusalem when he was 12, and then the caravan, the family group starts heading back and you know, about a day into this, well, where's Jesus? I thought he was with you. I, know, I thought he was with you, and then we can't find him. So three days agonizing over what has become of our child, only to find out, well, you know, he's God's son, and he says, well, I'm, I'm doing my father's business. What did you expect? Had to be some weird things growing up, knowing that you've been so favored by the Lord. So maybe we could slow down as we look at this story and reflect a little bit on our own hardships. Surely there are things in your life that maybe as you've asked for God to help you grow, sometimes the way that God helps us to grow is by sending us things that make us uncomfortable. Sometimes the way we grow most is when God sends us things that are difficult, perhaps things that we don't desire. But it's people who are especially favored by God so often who have these difficult things occur. There's a third couple I wanted to mention, and they're not a married couple, but it's two people named Simeon and Anna when Jesus was presented at the temple. These are also people favored by God. It came time to honor the purification rites according to the law of Moses. As the firstborn male, Jesus was to be set aside for the Lord along with a small sacrifice. And I'm going to read here. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. 
His companion here is uh, Anna. It says there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Again, what does it mean to be favored by God? Can you imagine being married for seven years and then being widowed until you're 84? But then, finally, finally, after all that waiting, getting to be such a significant part of God's story and what God was doing. I think all of us struggle with patience, don't we? I mean, these days it's hard to wait five minutes. I get irritated if I've got four bars instead of five on my smartphone, right? Like we don't like anything that slows us down or obstructs. It's hard to wait five minutes. Really hard to hang on for a few years while you're going through a struggle or a major illness or a change in your family situation that you're not quite sure what to do about. It's really hard to keep believing after a few years have been disappointing. Can you imagine waiting as long as Simeon and Anna did to see God's promises fulfilled in their lives? Day after day, trusting God, but not really knowing when it was coming, when that better day was coming. But just the same, isn't this why we keep trusting in the Lord? Because God does things in His timing, and sometimes it's not on the same time frame that we would like, but, but when we wait on the Lord... When we keep hanging on and we keep trusting and believing and doing what we believe to be the right thing, trying to trust in Jesus and follow in his footsteps, when we persist in being faithful even through hardship, we get to see the better side of what it means to be favored by God. We get to be encouraged. We get to have our strength renewed. We get to be refreshed. And even as I've highlighted those three couples and what must have been some significant struggles for them, I imagine that I could invite any three of those couples up here to talk to you and they would tell you, sure, that was rough, but, but the blessings of faithfulness far outweigh the difficulties of waiting. I didn't enjoy the waiting. I didn't enjoy the uncertainty. I didn't enjoy the times that people misunderstood what was happening. But get, getting to see where it all was going, it was worth hanging on. It was worth not giving up because... My eyes have seen what God has done, that God has favored us. As Christians, I, I truly believe that God has favored all of us, that there's a lot of ways that we among all people are blessed because we don't have to just anticipate Jesus, but know Jesus, and also walk with Jesus. It means several different things. I'm going to highlight three of these. So for us to be favored by God, one thing this means for us is that we get to be receivers of the promise. We get to be receivers of the promise that all that God had promised to do through his Messiah, through his son, we are the recipients of these things. The Apostle Peter, uh, in his first letter, talks about the way that prophets could get glimpses of this stuff. You know, hundreds of years before it happened, they're looking ahead and they'd get a glimpse of something and they wanted to know so badly, how is God going to work all this together? I, I trust that God is good and that He's faithful, but I just, I don't see how these components are going to come together. Even the stories around Jesus' birth, I mean, on the one hand, it's promised that He's going to, you know, be born in Bethlehem. But he's also going to kind of be from Nazareth because they're going to call him a Nazarene. But then we have Hosea saying, well, out of Egypt I called my son. So can you imagine on the front end of that trying to figure out how does a person have all three of those forms of heritage? Like, I can't picture it, but then Jesus comes and perfectly fulfills that, that he is born in Bethlehem because of the census. And because Herod's trying to kill him, they have to flee to Egypt. And he is called back out of Egypt. And then because he's raised in Nazareth, he's called a Nazarene. See, we, we have the benefit of seeing God's wisdom on the other side. We're receivers of this promise. We already get to see ways that God was working all these things together for good. And because we see that God is ultimately the architect and the master of history, it lets us know that even though things in our life may be difficult, the things that we endure for the sake of the gospel are never truly meaningless. Everything that we endure when we stay faithful, we are going to be the receivers of the promises of God. A second thing this means for us is that we get to be nurturers 
of the mission of God. I just love that of all the ways God could have come into the world, it's not like Greek mythology where some gods would like spring out of Zeus's head fully like grown up. Like he came to us as a child in need of our hospitality. God didn't come to remind us how strong he was. God came to us in the form of weakness where for him to survive, someone had to love him. You know, there are people who had the opportunity to g- teach Jesus as he grew up. Can you think about that? That he came to us in need of hospitality, inviting us, welcoming us to be part of his story. And even now, God delights in working through his church, imperfect as we are. I was talking with one of you the other day, and we were talking about parenting and and Christmas decorations in particular. And one of you was telling me how, like, you know, if you just wanted to decorate a Christmas tree, you yourself could probably knock it out in like an hour or two hours. But if you got a little son or daughter that's wanting to help you with it, suddenly maybe a one-hour project becomes a five- or six-hour project. But, you know, they're never going to learn how to do it unless you give them the space to learn. But this is the way that God treats us as his children. Certainly, if God wanted to accomplish the salvation of the world, he could just do it himself really easily. Or he could, you know, do whatever he wants. But he said, no, I'm not going to coerce anybody. I'm not going to push anybody. But I'm going to be patient and I'm going to let my church be the ones to go out and share the gospel. I'm going to choose to love people through my churches. I'm going to welcome people through their hands and their hospitality and their kindness. God is choosing the longer route and the slower route because he wants us to be part of this story, not just observers of the story, but participants in this story, that he came to us wanting to receive our hospitality because when we welcome even the least of these, we welcome him. He's told us again and again, whatever we do for the weak and for the poor and for those who are vulnerable, we have done for him. So we have the privilege of sowing the word. We cultivate the message. We see it spring up and give new life to people. We get to be nurturers of the mission of God. And because of all these things, we get to be witnesses of God's goodness. As people of faith who continue to be faithful, we continue to pay attention to what God is doing in the world, and even through our feeble efforts, we get the joy of seeing God be good, that we get to see our prayers be answered, that we get to see someone that we studied with or we tried to encourage growing up to be someone who is a leader or a great person. We get to see people who've made bad choices suddenly make better choices and be blessed for that. We get to be witnesses of God and the flourishing that comes from that. So what does it mean to each of us that Christ has been born and that he put on human flesh? I'm going to return to our friend Simeon and I'm going to let him describe it. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 34, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Jesus comes especially to preach good news to the poor and freedom to the captives. For those of us who would try to set ourselves up to be powerful, who would try to be self-made people, who try to tell ourselves we don't need God's help and we're pretty good on our own, God has a way of, of humbling such people. And when we think in those ways, God humbles us. Sometimes Jesus being the Son of God means that we're going to have to fall and humble ourselves. But to those of us who've been discouraged, to those of us who are looking for hope, to those of us who are hoping there is someone to provide a better way of being and a better answer to our problems in the world is producing, to all such people, God is providing a message of hope and optimism. There's falling, but there's also the rising of many who've been waiting for the hope that comes from God. Because ultimately what happens is that Jesus Christ has a way of revealing our thoughts. There are some people who try to speak of Jesus as if he were just some kind of a good teacher, like a good life guru, a life coach. You know, I want a a few good tips on how to live and what to be. but, But Jesus is so much more than that. He doesn't allow us that neutral position, that he's come to us claiming to be our Lord and our Savior and the Son of God. And we have to respond to that. We don't have the option of just trying to be okay with Jesus. We're either going to be passionately for Jesus or passionately against Jesus. You're either going to acknowledge his lordship in your life and you're going to live for him or you're going to fight against it because he's got no use for people who try to ride the fence in the middle. 
It's what he says in the book of Revelation. He says, it makes me want to gag. It makes me want to vomit such things out of my mouth. Be with me or be against me, but don't try to be neutral towards me. The Son of God has come into the world. The angels have blasted with celebration what a significant moment that is. And now it is for each of us to decide how we will respond to that truth, that the Son of God has entered the world, He is our Savior, and that in Him we find life. If you're here this morning needing encouragement, we would love for Jesus to help exalt you. If you're a person here this morning and you know that you need to be humbled, we would encourage you to humble yourself at the feet of Jesus to name him as your Lord. If there's any way we can assist you today, we invite you to come forward at this time and talk to us about that. As together we stand and sing this song.